Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. In this next part of our exclusive special series with Michael Sikora, founder and director of the Socrates Project within the Reagan White House, we tackle the question, what the sole key weapon for the future is, if there is one, and China's place in that race. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. So the past couple episodes, we've been talking about potential hot war between the two countries, kind of how we got here, how we can counter it. It seems right now there's a lot of focus in these next tech race breakthroughs, right? We have quantum on the horizon, AI, supercomputers. What's happening here? It's a silver bullet approach, okay. As we've talked about before, at Harvard, it teaches you to look at the bell curve. You know, if, if it's from a market perspective, where do you get, where are most of your customers going to be satisfied? And you focus on them and everything on the edges just doesn't matter. You know, forget about it. Bang for the buck sort of a thing. But that sort of thinking is so pervasive in the United States at all levels of decision making, in all military, economic, well, basically all sectors of the U.S. economic and military competitiveness ecosystem, okay? But that runs counter to how Chinese operates. So Americans take the silver bullet approach in the case of, of military hot war with China. In contrast, China doesn't do that. They're looking holistically at everything. So if we look at the silver bullet approach, the latest silver bullets are quantum, AI, what have you, okay? This, I mean, we've tried the silver bullet approach so many times. Back in the 2001-2002 time frame, which we were involved with, uh, everybody throughout the military knew that UAVs, and they would state this, the admirals and the generals, UAVs are going to be the centerpiece of all our military strategies. And that will give us the competitive advantage in all competitive environments for as far as we can see. Why? Because we own the key technologies in that. Fast forward. That doesn't give us much of a competitive edge. Do we use UAVs? Yeah. But back then, in 2002, when we worked with originally Navy and then SecDef's office, Secretary of Defense's office on this, we saw that the technology was very widely distributed worldwide, number one. And we saw that it wasn't just leading edge technology. So much of the functionality of a UAV could be accomplished with high tech, medium tech, low tech, and what have you. So America's position that because we are the leader, which we actually weren't, in so many of the most high tech technologies in terms of autonomous, uh, staying up for a long time, whatever, was going to make it the key resource, key technology, didn't work out at all. Why? Because so many of the functions could be accomplished with low tech, medium tech, no tech, okay? Technologies are becoming more universally distributed worldwide. There is leading technology capabilities in countries you've never even heard of, okay? So all of a sudden, that silver bullet didn't come to pass. Okay, which then comes back to the issue of it's not a matter of one magical technology for one massive competitive advantage. It's more a matter of exploiting the full range of technologies, high tech, low tech, medium tech, hard and soft, and those that are critical and those that are very minor in order to just very adroitly maneuver in all these technologies exploitation of them in order to generate major competitive advantage, minor competitive advantage, like we talked in one of the previous episodes. If, we, if China doesn't get the latest equipment, latest fighter up to snuff the United States, well, they just go to a little bit better training so the pilots are a little bit better with less effective hardware. And the Soviets didn't have the computing power, so their theory was a hell of a lot better than ours. So the Soviets did it, the Chinese are 10 times better at it, very adroitly maneuvering in this full range of technology. On the other hand, the U.S. is like, you know, as soon as we get that breakthrough in quantum, 
we're going to be great. As soon as we get the breakthrough in AI, it's going to solve everything. It's this magic bullet. And the thing is, in the United States, we just don't do that in the military. We also did that in the economic perspective aspect of the United States. Because remember a few years ago, when the U.S. economy was on decline, uh, I think it was Harvard came out and said, you know what, we need to be the idea economy. China's doing manufacturing, so let's do the idea man uh, economy, and that's going to make us great. Didn't work. Next thing was, a couple of generations later, you know, uh, cycles of the White House, the green economy. We're going to be the green economy. We're going to lead the world in the green economy. Well, that silver bullet didn't work, and we still continued on the decline. Why? Because our adversaries, especially in the commercial sector of China, is working in the full range of technologies to generate minor and major competitive edge. Because, I mean, going back to the silver bullet perspective, because we were the grand poobah for so long in the world, and because technology evolved very slowly, you could literally, a decision maker just could figure that if he exploited a technology better than anybody else with a leading capability, that technology was good enough to maintain the company, to maintain his career for its entirety. But now technology evolves so fast, the distribution is so wide, it flows so easily that the only way to generate a competitive advantage is by maneuvering in the technology exploitation in a very fluid, dynamic, offensive and defensive fashion. So this silver bullets of you know, hypervelocity vehicles and AI and whatever, which doesn't mean they ignore the other ones, but it's like AI is the answer. That's not going to work. Which, one last point, that doesn't mean that China's not going great guns on AI and doing great guns on uh, quantum. They're going full force on that. But they're doing it within the context of all the other technologies, low-tech, medium-tech, as well as in the context of all technologies in general. Because one of the differences is, is China addresses technology the way it actually is, which is a single continuum. So if we really look at it, technology and pre-technology is a single continuum. It's all interconnected, okay? But Americans silo it. When we've worked with somebody like Ford, and we've talked about cross-pollinating with certain technologies out of the aerospace industry, the response is, that's aerospace technology. We're not going to use that. It's technology. But yet when we've worked with uh, and talked with some of the Asian companies in Japan and Taiwan, it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense, you know, technology is technology. Technology is basically blind. So cross-pollinating with an aerospace and then bringing in something from the textile and the entertainment business and looking at those cross-pollinations to generate a competitive advantage and then later bringing another one to further increase it was fluid, dynamic, and it's how you operate. To Americans, it's siloed. Here's our technology, it's automotive industry technology, and that's that. Which then brings us to what the Socrates project and the Socrates system was designed to do, which was one of the things that gives us such a major competitive edge over China. The heart of the Socrates system is a map of all technology space. Technology space is the complete set of technologies and pre-technologies, theory, basic research, applied research, all the way up to technology. And it's four dimensions of that set of all pre-technology uh, and technology, the four dimensions which define it, fully dictate how it can be exploited for a competitive advantage. So within Socrates, we can see the entire technology continuum, technology and pre-technology. And we can see all the ways to exploit it. Okay. That is the core system, and that's what allows us to execute technology exploitation as a science rather than an art. Because China also sees technology as a continuum with none of these artificial barriers that Americans tend to put it with that, but they can only do it as an art. So it's very vague, it's what they can think of, we can actually map it out in hard copy. Expanding on that note a bit, it seems when it comes to, say, these next key areas that are always in the focus, say, quantum, 
quantum computers, the AI, all of this. The recent breakthroughs we've seen in the field or surprises out of China when it comes to, say, maybe the hypersonic missile or the latest buzz in the quantum world, it's like a hybrid combination, which is something that we weren't expecting in the West. So going forward, it sounds like it's a combination, almost looking at the whole picture, right? As you were mentioning, holistic and coherent. So what would that strategy look like for us to really make sure we win or stay ahead? Well, it comes back to you know what we designed in Socrates, which is imagine, and this is the way it works, imagine that you could go into a room and up on the screen, a big, you know, one of the biggest displays they have, you could actually see technology space graphically, which we, that's what it was designed to do, such that you can see what's in pre-technology theory, basic research, whatever. You can, you can actually see China's technology strategy, okay, holistically within all of technology space with all its paths for exploitation, okay? And then you can actually see, oh, you can see all the opportunities and constraints and say, you know what? China is going to do a technology flank attack. But by the, because technology space is defined by the laws of physics, okay? So there's, you know, this idea of, well, it's all uncertain thing, like, no. Force equals mass times acceleration, okay? And all the other cute things that I learned as a physicist, okay, is that it's those four dimensions, technology space, are defined by the laws of physics. So the uncertainty level is extremely small. But as a side note, laws of physics, laws of nature are not identical. It's man's and understanding of laws of nature, so there's a little bit of rub room there. But now you can see their technology strategy holistically. You can see all technology space holistically. So now it's like shooting fish in a barrel. Okay? Where Another analogy is, imagine it's Civil War time period, and the other side's got Civil War style technology, which means they've got spy scopes, which are pretty bad, only see a few more feet than they normally could hand, and communications is via uh, runners who half the time forget what the viewers told, or they embellish it one way or the other, or get shot, which makes them not get through. So it's very archaic, and let's say that's me, and you've got real-time download satellite feeds, high resolution. You can see the entire battlefield. You can see my entire troops. You can see what they're having for dinner. You can see if they have actually any food or you're, they're starving to death. Okay. Now we engage. You can see exactly where my troops are. You can see they haven't eaten in three days, for example. So you know what? simple example, you just make sure there's a farmhouse there with a lot of food left over and they all stop and get eat and stop and put down their guns and you guys, you send your guys over there, small group of guys and set up an ambush and capture all of them, okay, because they're just feasting because they haven't eaten in three days. So the point is that's, that's the difference. So now we can not be stuck on the silver bullets. We see things holistically. And we see things in terms of high-tech, medium-tech, low-tech, where we can see, because again, from an American's point of view, we're looking for the big kill with the high-tech, because high-tech gives you the big kill on the critical technologies. But just like in UAVs, it's like, oh, you know, you can take a toy airplane, put, you know, a small plane of C4 on it, and just shoot it up there, and with a tele another guy is a, is a spotter, you can do the same damage as one of the high-tech multi-million dollar UAVs, okay? Because when you're looking at holistically all the technology, critical to quote non-critical, which is really not a term because they're all critical, when you can see high-tech to low-tech to no-tech, I say no-tech because it's all technology, okay? If it's accomplishing a function, it is some application of science. You know, this is technology. If you go back a few hundred years, this would be considered magical leading edge, okay? You took away all pencils in the world and all pens, we'd have a difficult time. So now you can see that, you know what? 
in order to not just have this gee whiz killer capability in the battlefield, but to have enough competitive advantage in the battlefield, all I've got to do is take a technology which is already ready for deployment, hook it up with some other technologies which are tried and true, and guess what? We have a competitive advantage while America's sitting over there going, you know what? We're going we're gonna to show you who's boss here any minute now because this is really going to clean your clock someday. They got a competitive advantage already. So the point is, when you can see all technology space, you can see the high tech, medium tech, low tech, and you can see, oh, I can't totally solve all the problems with the level of technology in quantum or hypervelocity vehicles, but if I combine that with some of these other technologies, I can generate a significant competitive advantage which Americans can't, can't counter, can't, can't counter. And after that, when we advance this one a little bit, then we'll advance it and we'll continue to keep ahead of the, of the Americans because we've hooked it with all these other ones. The other cool thing about technology space, four-dimensional technology space, is there's no discontinuities in there. What we mean by that is nothing magically ever happens in technology space. So where Americans and classic thinking is, oh, we couldn't have seen China doing that. Nobody could have predicted that. It's, that's magical. No. When you look at all technology space as a continuum, four-dimensional uh, continuum, you see that every progression to generate a competitive advantage makes a logical progression through the various dimensions. So you can look at, we could look at China and see here's the progression they're doing with this high-tech quantum or hypervelocity vehicle connecting it with this, which is going to give them this competitive advantage. There's no magic there. Okay, laws of physics. But then we can go in there and say, hmm, what happens if we block that one low-tech that they're actually going to get buying on the free market from Germany? Let's classify it as a NATO ally. Let's see what we can do to block it. Or, better yet, what happens if the technology we give them is not exactly what they think they got, such that it never quite works, which we've been known to do in the past. Okay. So that's how you play the game. That was Michael Sikora, founder and director of the Socrates Project within the Reagan White House. And after the break, we continue our exclusive special coverage with him on what comes next. Now that we've covered the fundamental differences in how each side operates, what should we be focusing on? Our full episode is available on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you soon.